Greetings friends, Pastor Kyle here and I'm playing Simon Says with some of my pre-K friends at the Early Childhood Center. All right, Simon Says, raise your right hand. Simon Says, put your hand down. Simon Says, raise your left leg. Put your left leg down. Oh, Simon didn't say put it down. All right, Simon Says, put your leg down. All right, Simon Says, turn around and wave at the camera. All right, Simon Says, turn back this way. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us today for our online worship services. We're going to be talking about being a follower, following a Jesus, and how we need to watch him closely so that we can do as he calls us to do. And so wherever you are, again, I'm so thankful you've chosen to worship with us today. I invite you to whatever that's been happening this week to let it all go, let it out behind you, breathe in the Spirit of God, and prepare your hearts for an attitude of worship as we now prepare to go live to still our first UMC. All right, Simon says, put your hands together. Simon says, bow your head. Now you can look up. Ah, Simon didn't say. Hey, I didn't look <laughs> Good job. Greetings and welcome to the Stillwater First United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Kyle, and whether you're worshiping with us here in this space, or you're joining us via our YouTube live stream, it is an honor to be worshiping with you today. An exciting day in the life of our church. It's the second Sunday of the season of Lent, but it's also our third grade Bible Sunday. So we presented our third graders' Bibles in our 8.30 service, but we're going to introduce them to you here in this. We're also going to get to hear from our children's choir and all that and more. So I invite you to go ahead and rise and buy your spirit however you're most comfortable as we offer this song of praise today is the day. Good morning, welcome to worship. Let's put this song up together, sing his praises. I'm casting my cares aside, I'm leaving my past behind, I'm setting my heart and mind on you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hand to yours, believing there's so much more, knowing that all you have in store for me is good. It's good. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is a day. I'm putting my fears aside. I'm leaving my doubts behind. I'm giving my hopes and dreams to you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hand to yours. Believe in there's so much more Knowing that all you have in store for me is good It's good Today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it Today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it and I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is a day. Today is a day. And I will stand upon your truth. And I will stand upon your truth. And all my days I'll live for you. And all my days I'll live for you. And I will stand upon your truth. I will stand upon your truth. And all my days I'll live for you. And all my days I'll live. Today is the day you have been. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have been. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow i'm giving you my fears and sorrows where you lead me i will follow i'm trusting in what you say today is a day today is a day today is the day today is the day
Here we go. Come on, Dave. Father's house, come and go with me to my father's house. It's a big, big house with lots and lots of room. A big, big table with lots and lots of food. A big, big yard where we can play football. A big, big house. It's my father's house. Got some shelter, some place to hide. I don't know if you live with friends in whom you can confide. I don't know if you got a family, mom or dad. I don't know if you feel love at all, but I bet you wish you had. Come and go with me to my father's house. Come and go with me to my father's house. It's a big, big house. With lots and lots of food, a big, big table with lots and lots of food, a big, big yard where we can play football, a big, big house. It's my father's house. All I know is a big old house with rooms for everyone. All I know is lots of land where we can play and run. All I know is you need love, got a family. All I know is you're all alone, so why not come with me? Come and go with me to my father's house. Come and go with me to my father's house. It's a big, big house with lots and lots of a big, big table with lots and lots of food. A big, big yard where we can play football. A big, big house. It's my father's home. And go with me to my father's house. Come and go with me to my father's house. It's a big, big house with lots and lots of rooms. A big, big table with lots and lots of food. A big, big yard where we can play football. A big, big house. It's my father's house. Amen. You may be seated. And I want to invite uh, our children's education director, Miss Chris, to come forward along with our third graders. As I mentioned briefly at the start of the service, today is Third Grade Bible Sunday. And it's that time when we as a church present the third graders from our family of faith uh, with their very own Bible. And so uh, they received those during our 830 service. And, but we want to make sure that you have a chance to meet them as well. And so, uh, Miss Chris, I'll invite you to introduce our third graders. Okay, we have here Caden Anderson. We have Theo Calicote, Avery Fontenier, Charlotte Hayes, and Gideon Mazak. All right. And so between now and Easter, they're going to be meeting together in a Sunday school hour, going to be in a Bible study, learning how to use their Bibles. They've also got a challenge uh, from me to uh, go through a workbook we presented them, read some special scriptures, make sure they make it to three out of the four of those uh, Bible study lessons. And then they get a special shirt that says, I have a Bible and I know how to use it, as well as another special treat. So we're excited for them. And, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about it later, but know that we encourage you as well to be a part of strengthening and encouraging these third graders as they grow in the life of faith. And now I'm going to hand over to Pastor Cindy to pray over our third graders and us. Truth to our lives and teach us how to live and how to love. We pray your blessings and that your Holy Spirit be with each of these children as they study your word 
that they may learn to, and to love you more, to learn more about your love for them, and that they may grow to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ and become all that you have called them to be. We ask that you be with each one of us, too, that we would recommit ourselves to reading and studying your word, that you might lead us and guide us and flow through us to make a difference in building your kingdom here in this world. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. All right. We're going to let most of them head out, except for Caden. I'll take your Bible. And then we're going to get to... Oh, you're going to take it? All right. And then we're going to get to hear from our, third, or our children's choir. Tiny little baby in his hand, he's got the tiny little baby in his hand, he's got the whole world in his hand. All things bright and beautiful, every creature great and small, all things wise and wonderful, he's got the whole Thank you, Children's Choir. Uh, a couple of announcements I want to share with you. First of all, we continue with it. Go right ahead. <laughs> we, 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 can, we can stage change here. It's all right. Um, uh, thank you to each and every one of you who have contrib contributed so far to our Rise Against Hunger Linton emphasis. As a reminder, here at Stillwater First GMC, every Lent, we join with other area United Methodist churches to raise funds for Rise Against Hunger. We invite you to give up something small during the season of Lent. Maybe that's a, uh, you know, that coffee, that Sonic run, maybe one meal a week, maybe some entertainment outing. And whatever you would spend on that each week, you bring that with you every Sunday and you donate it to Stillwater First GMC. You write, you know, Rise Against Hunger on the memo line, you write it in the envelope, or if you're donating online remotely, you select the Rise Against Hunger drop-down box, and we collect all that, bring it together, and see how far we've made it each week towards our $20,000 goal. As of after week one, we raised over tw just over $2,600, so we're well on our way towards that $20,000 goal. I know you'll be contributing today, as that you continue to do so each and every week as we see that uh, Methodist thermometer rise. Okay, second, I got a 
very important announcement and thing to share, something to share with you is that I want you to, um, inside, you have, inside your bulletin, you have a survey. I shared with you back in January that I had two priorities for this year, leadership here within our church and worship. New members of our church, longtime members of our church, cite as one of our strengths here at Stillwater First UMC that our worship is one of our strengths. But we also don't want to just be content with that. We want to make sure we're doing everything we can across our three services to allow opportunities for as many people as possible to be able to uh, have a meaningful worship experience. And, you know, for those of us worshiping with us online as well. So you have an insert inside of your bulletin that has a QR code as well as a website in case you the QR code, uh, you don't want to utilize that, as well as a website website, minty.com, with a code on it, or you've got it up here on the screen, and here, just because I heard some things in the first service, some people were having trouble, so I'm going to test it. All right, I tested the QR code, and, and I've got it right there on my phone. You'll see it, our blue you know, logo for our church will come up, and you're at the right place. And so take that insert or scan that and just leave that on your phone till after the service or during the sermon if you need something to do. You can fill it out at that point. But I need, I need everyone to fill this out. Whether you're a member or not, if you've been worshiping with us for a little while, you plan on continuing to worship with us, we want to hear from you. Because it's not going to be helpful if you just hear from a handful of people. Like say we've got a handful of people who just really feel like I should mime my sermons and that's all we hear from. You know, I'd hate to start miming my sermons just because the only people we heard from was the mime contingent and everyone else couldn't be bothered to fill out the survey. So even if you think to yourself, hey, you know, I, I think everything's great. Like I wouldn't change anything. I don't think I wouldn't take anything away. You know, I, there's some wisdom in if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I also need to hear that from you as well. Our worship committee needs to hear that from you as well. So please take the time to fill that out. This information is also in the e-news, and you can get it there if you get our email. It would be really helpful if everyone did this digitally. But I know there's some individuals who don't have Internet access. And so if that's you and you aren't able to access the Internet, we do have in the back a handful of hard copies of the survey that if you fill those out, bring them to the church by end of the day, Wednesday, March 6th, you know, I will manually input those results uh, for you into the survey. I do need to mention that um, um, it, uh, towards the end, it will ask for your name and contact information. That information is private, but the rest of it, you get to share with the rest of the congregation. So you get a chance at the end to say, send me the results, and you'll get an email with the results, and you can see what everyone else thinks. And, um, and so be sure to click that, and it'll be the results of everyone that's filled it out at that point. So just hold on to that email and check back in a couple weeks and see what, ha- what, what the, re- the entire congregation, uh, what your, their thoughts are on the worship here. So what our first gym see. Thank you so much for helping us out, both you, those of you here in this space and those of you worshiping with us remotely. We can't wait to hear from you. And now I'm going to hand things over to Pastor Cindy as she leads us in a time of prayer. I invite you to join me in an attitude of prayer. Creator God, we do give you thanks for the breath of life that you breathed into each one of us, for the animals and the plants and the beauty that surrounds us around the world. May we be good stewards of all that you have created. We give you thanks for your healing grace, for your teaching challenges, and your call upon our lives. Thank you that what is written in the Gospels and in our hearts is the story of Jesus of Nazareth who invites us to come, who invites us to follow. Yet we still need your help that we might put you first in our lives. For those times when we entertain doubts about you or we neglect to honor you regularly with our worship, when we ignore your word and our Bible gathers dust, forgive us, we pray. We rejoice that in your grace you offer to grant forgiveness when we ask. You offer to teach us, to lead us, and to guide us as we follow you. So it is with thanksgiving and praise we bring to you our abilities and talents together with our tithes and offerings. Pour out your blessings upon them and use them that others may come to experience your love, your presence, and your grace. It's together that we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon him. He gave as heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake. Pastor Kyle will be speaking to us this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. Jesus has called several disciples to follow him. He's worked a couple of miracles, and we come to verse 27. At this he went out, and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up, left everything, and followed him. 
Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in his house, and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord to live and to share. Thanks be to God. Now, I did fail to mention earlier when talking about the survey. Now, if any of you go on there and you recommend that I start miming my sermons, I'm just invalidating your entire survey, okay? I don't need any smart Alex in the group, okay? <laughs> but, um, uh, but to the actual sermon and purpose of today, I found myself uh, thinking about driver's education this past week. I know that sounds probably like an odd thing to be thinking about. I promise I wasn't just waxing nostalgic and, you know, thinking about to younger days. But, but I, I, I had a reason for it. But I was thinking about driver's education. And when Elk City, where I went to high school, it was taught uh, by one of the football coaches each and every summer. And I remember going, and when I was 15, and I was that fall would be trying to take the test to get my driver's permit. And then later that spring, when I turned 16, be trying to get my license and I remember the, the, this instructor, he, he had to teach us a lot of things. And I'm sure there's a whole lot of information that I internalized. Because as you can ask my wife, Heather, I'm an impeccable driver. But, um, but anyways, there's really just one lesson, though, that he shared that has just stayed with me. And just I've, I've held on to all these years. He was talking to us about, you know, sometimes you're driving at night. And maybe there's someone, you know, in the other lane coming towards you and you want to, like, get their attention for some reason. Maybe they're, you think they're kind of starting to drift over into your lane. Maybe they've got their high beams on. And the common practice is you flash your lights at them, right? You know, trying to get their attention that they're not quite driving correctly or they need to know something. And he said, that's okay, but don't flash your lights more than once. And he told us, he said, because imagine that for some reason their senses are impaired. And that's why they're not quite staying in their lane. That's why their high beams are on. And now you're flashing your lights at them. And, you, and they're going to start to look over at your lights. You've now grabbed their attention. And that's the last thing you want. Because people drive towards what they're looking at. And that little nugget of information like, has stayed with me ever since then. People drive towards what they're looking at. And this past week, that kind of came into my mind, and at first I thought to myself, now is that like some like folk wisdom from my old high school football coach, or is that like a real thing? And so, so I like did some searching real quick, and I found some articles on the internet. I found other driver's education curriculum that said it's a proven fact that humans have a tendency to drive towards what they're looking at. That's why it's so important that, uh, you know, yes, you need to be scanning while you're driving and kind of taking, paying attention, but you need to be looking, for the most part, forward. And don't spend too much time looking at that person sitting next to you, you that you're talking to or looking at some object off in the distance or looking at your dials and meters and, and uh, your phone or anything else that's in the car for too long because as you do, you're naturally going to start to drive wherever you're looking. And I began to think about that this week as I thought about our life of faith. We as a people of faith, we as Christians, we're called to obviously focus in upon, to look at, to follow Jesus, right? But we also have to be careful about things that might distract us. Money, power, wealth, influence, pleasures, whatever it might be. What are those things that we may begin to focus on, we may begin to focus on for so long that they pull us off of the path or the road of discipleship? I want to talk a bit more today about this idea of following Jesus. Uh, but uh, as we, this is the second Sunday in our sermon series, Pass on the Truth. For those of you who weren't with us last week, as a reminder, uh, during the season of Lent, we're preaching upon and doing a deep dive into the Gospel of Luke. As we learn about the truth contained within that gospel, and so that then come Easter, we'll be prepared to pass on the good news of the risen Christ. And so today we look at this story of Jesus calling Levi the tax collector. As we begin, let's do so with a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we do give you thanks for this opportunity we have to come together to fellowship with one another and to worship you. It is our prayer, O oh Lord, that you might guide and direct us, strengthen us so that we might remain focused upon and heading towards you. And so, Lord, in order to do so, we pray that you be present with us. Pour out your Spirit upon us, whether we're worshiping here in this space or worshiping remotely. Unite us by your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Spirit. Use me as a vessel. Speak through me to share with each of us your message of truth and grace this day. Amen. 
So Jesus walks up to Levi at the tax collector's booth at the start of today's story. And as our story begins, there's a couple of things I want you to keep in mind. First of all, and you've probably heard this before, but let's remember what we know about tax collectors during Jesus' time. Tax collectors were often people who were from the community. Uh, they, were, they were of the nationality of the people they were taxing. But they were hired by the Roman Empire to collect taxes for the empire. And so this was often a lucrative business for the tax collector, but also meant they were like considered the lowest of society, the worst of the people, because they were getting rich off of the misery of their, and off of cheating their fellow Jews in this case. And you may have also, as you either read this story this past week as part of our Lenten readings, or as you heard Pastor Cindy read it for us, you may have thought to yourself, I've heard this story before, but I could swear his name was Matthew. And he went on to write a whole gospel, right? Like, I'm pretty sure I've heard this before. And if, if you thought that to yourself, you are correct. Levi and Matthew are the same person. See, Levi is his Hebrew or Jewish name. Matthew is his Greek name. Which makes sense. A lot of people would do that back during that time where obviously he's, he's a Jew. He's got this Jewish name, but especially as a tax collector working for the Roman Empire, he does a lot of work with Greek-speaking Romans. And so he also has a Greek name. And so that's where this comes from. And Luke refers to him by his Jewish name, Levi, in our scripture. All right, so Jesus walks up to this tax booth to where Levi is. And i got to imagine myself, with all that context that you now have, you know, the disciples that Jesus has already called, Peter, James, and John, he's also got probably a crowd that's kind of following along with him. I can imagine they're probably all thinking to themselves, look at this. Look, look. Like, look, boy, he is going to give this man a tongue lashing. Jesus is going to give him a piece of his mind, right? And then maybe they start to kind of take bets. Like, what is Jesus going to say? Oh, I know. He's going to say, he's going to call him a traitor. How dare you betray your people? Or, oh, no, 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 no. I bet he'll say, if you love Rome so much, why don't you move there? Or, or no, 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 no. He's going to tell him, I bet your mother's real proud of you. <laughs> so, you know, they're kind of like, they're waiting. Like, Shh, let's see what Jesus has to say to him. And Jesus walks up to this tax collector, despised by all his fellow Jews, as he gets rich off of, you know, off of taking money from them. And Jesus looks at him and says, Follow me. Follow me. I can imagine there's probably like an audible gasp amongst the disciples in the crowd. <gasps> like, <what? laughs> Did we hear him correctly? Well, we're followers of Jesus. And, and he, wants, he wants this guy to be one of us? I appreciate what some other pastors and authors have, have, have said about the scripture. Uh, Dr. Michael Bowie, uh, he writes that Jesus... Doesn't ever have like a strategic plan. You know, all of us pastors, we like our strategic plans, our discipleship pathways and, and all these things. So Jesus doesn't have any of that. He just has an invitation. Follow me. I appreciate pastor and author Andy Stanley when talking about this. He, he, he says, take notice of what Jesus doesn't say in this moment. He doesn't say, do blank and then you can come and follow me. Start doing X. Stop doing Y. Here's a checklist. Get all these tasks done and mark them all off. Over the next week, I'll come back. And if you've done them all, then you can follow me. No, Jesus doesn't say any of that. He just simply invites him. Follow me. And imagine how that sounds from Levi's perspective. Levi, who, who is despised by his neighbors, his community members, probably his family even. He's, you know, as people look at him, they probably look at him with disdain and contempt and anger. And, you know, and even though, yeah, maybe he's doing well financially, how much of his life has suffered because he's chosen to be a tax collector? And here comes this Jesus. This rabbi, this holy man, who word about him has begun to spread throughout the region but these amazing things that he's been teaching and these miracles that he's been performing, the lives he's been transforming. Oh no. And now he's coming to talk to me. And everyone's watching. What's he going to say to me? And imagine you're Levi and Jesus looks at you. He says, follow me. Yeah, obviously I know your profession. I know what you're doing. But I want you to follow me. I, I, I want to associate with you. I want you to be one of my people, part of my posse. <laughs> I want you to be a part of my family. Do you want to associate with me too? I mean, imagine as Jesus is giving him this simple invitation, 
She's probably looking at him in a way that only Jesus can with that kind of care, compassion, forgiveness, and love. And It's no wonder Levi drops everything and follows him, right? How long has it been since he's had someone care about him that deeply to say, I want to share life with you. Then it gets even better, or worse if you're the other disciples. (laughs) Levi says, I'm going to throw a party for you, Jesus, at my house. And I'm going to invite all my friends. Can you imagine the disciples, Peter, James, and then they're like, okay, now hold on a second. Like, okay, so I mean, it's bad enough that this man's now associating with us, that we have to be seen with him. You can't seriously be considering going to his house and also having a, oh, Jesus is going to his house. There he goes. Okay, I guess we're, I guess we're going with him. And he's inviting all his friends. Do you know what kind of friends tax collectors had? Other tax collectors. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and they're always, you always read, you know, in the scripture, right? They're, they're associated with, you know, it's, it's tax collectors and sinners, right? Like nobody else wanted to be associated with tax collectors. I mean, even, it was so bad that even other sinners didn't want to be associated with tax collectors. They're like, we need a whole other category here. Like, I mean, I, I'm a sinner, but at least I'm not a tax collector. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so Jesus goes and his disciples go with him and they do the unthinkable. They go and they sit down and they have a meal at, at Levi's house in the home of this wealthy tax collector. And, and the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders of the day, you know, they, they all see this. And we don't know if maybe they, they, they see Jesus and his followers like walking into the house. Or maybe Levi had one of those like open courtyard setups that a lot of wealthy people had during Jesus' day. Where they had this open courtyard that faced the street. And that's where they would have all their banquets and their meals. So like other people could see how wealthy and affluent they were. And so maybe Levi's got one of those. But regardless of how it looks, I mean the, the, the Pharisees and religious leaders, they see what Jesus is doing. And, and the disciples you know, some of the disciples are kind of, maybe they're walking in and out, or maybe, let's say, Peter, he's got to step out for a moment. Peter's like, I got to get some breath of fresh air away from all these tax collector cooties, you know. So, he, so he's like stepped outside, and, and one of the religious leaders like grabs a hold of him and says, what are y'all doing? What, why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? And you hear, you hear the insinuation there, right? Like, that's your rabbi. He's supposed to be a holy person. And you're, you're associating with them? Like, what are you doing? And Jesus, you know, I don't know if maybe like Peter like gets this question. He comes back and he asks Jesus. Or maybe it's, it is one of those open courtyard things. And so Jesus is able to see and kind of hear what's going on. So maybe he just, he starts to yell. But whatever it is, it's, it's Jesus who responds to the Pharisees. And he tells them, you know, it's not the well who need a physician, but the sick. I've come to call, not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I can imagine, you know, I mean, we've heard this lots of times before, right? I mean, we've heard this idea that, oh, Jesus came not for the healthy, but for the sick, and not for the righteous, but for sinners, and to call us to repentance. And we've all heard that before, but imagine you're hearing that live. Like, you're sitting there at the table, you're Levi, you're one of Levi's tax collector friends, and you hear Jesus saying this to the Pharisees, and... You know, maybe at first you're kind of like, yeah, Jesus, you, you tell those Pharisees, you didn't come for the healthy, but for the sick. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> are you, Jesus, are you, you calling us sick? <laughs> are, you, are you saying we're not healthy? <laughs> are you saying we need to repent? You know, Jesus is so full of grace and forgiveness and love. But we all know to authentically be those things. You also have to be willing to be honest and truthful with others and with yourself. And so Luke, the story stops there, but I kind of imagine in my mind that maybe the conversation continued. Imagine Levi, like, Jesus, come on, man. Like, you're calling us sinners? You're saying we're sick? What's that about? I can imagine Jesus with that compassion, forgiveness, and loving way that only he can. He's probably honest with them. Come on, Levi. I mean, you're getting wealthy off of taking advantage of your neighbors. Does that sound spiritually healthy to you? As I read the scripture today and as we're trying to learn the truth so we can then pass it on, I, I hear a couple things. I, I hear that being a follower of Jesus is often much more simple than we make it. <laughs> You know, we like to have all our steps and all of our processes, but sometimes it's just being able to answer that question of, follow me but then also to acknowledge though that part of following Jesus is also being open and honest with others and most importantly with ourselves 
is to acknowledge that we have places in our lives where we have sin, where we are spiritually sick. And the only cure is to follow Jesus more closely. To allow his grace, his forgiveness, and his love to wash over us. To see like a world champion follow the leader player, you know, to make sure that we are watching Jesus and stepping where he's stepping and serving as he serves, loving as he loves, living as he lives. And we don't just stop there. It's, it's not just for us. It's for the Levi's and others in our world around us, in our family, in our places of work, here in our church, here in our community. The other people who are out there who maybe have felt kind of that, that twinge, that pull, that there's, there must be something more important to this life, something greater than myself. I want to I dedicate myself to something of eternal significance. And it's our job to help call them to come and follow, experience, and get to know the Jesus who has saved us, who we seek to serve. Because if we don't, if our preference is just to make sure we're hanging out with people who behave and look and act just like we do, we're going to find ourselves like the Pharisees, standing outside and having to look in on the room where Jesus is. And that's part of what we did today, third grade Bible Sunday. You know, that's part of what we do as a church is where we make sure that the children among us, that we pour into them, we care for them, we, we give our third graders a, a Bible so that they can learn and grow and study. We teach them how to use it so that they're prepared to follow and become more like Jesus so that as they get older and they begin to examine their lives and they're like, yeah, there's some places that I do have some sickness, some things that I need to get better at. And so I need to follow Jesus more closely and learn from him. That, that's why we do that. And, and, and I got to tell you, we need your help with that as, as a family of faith, as a church. We need you. I mean, I as, and Pastor Cindy as our pastors, Miss Chris as our children's ministry director, our staff and volunteers, we're going to do everything we can, but we also need your help. And, and I'm also saying this to you selfishly as the parent of one of those third graders who received their Bible today. I need you because we all know our kids don't listen to us. <laughs> I mean, you know that, right? You probably experienced that. I mean, how many times for any parents that are in the room, I mean, like, you know, you can tell your child something like a dozen times, and then they come home one day and they're like, did you know? <laughs> did you know I heard from so-and-so? And, 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 you know, and it's, and it's someone that they trust and something they, someone they care about, someone who more importantly has poured into and cared about them that they know. They say, oh, they taught me this thing. And you say, yeah, I've been telling you that for years. <laughs> We, we had a, I was with some other parents just last night, and one parent said, my kids want to learn nothing from me. Like, there's nothing they want to learn from me. So I know that this is, I'm not alone in this. That's why we need you. Faithful adults in their lives that can model for them, demonstrate for them, pour into them, show them what it looks like through your words, through your actions, through your life, what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We need you. We need each other. Because research tells us that, yes, we have a tendency to follow or to drive in the direction we're looking. But research, research also tells us that we have a tendency to follow the gaze of those we're watching. I don't know. I can't see if I caught anyone and anyone looked up. But, uh, <laughs> but we find, research shows us that people tend to follow the gaze of, of, of those we're watching. They did this, this research in New York City. Stereotypical, busy New York City street. Everyone moving along the sidewalk as fast as they can. And they started with one person. One person, one plant who just would stop and just, just kind of look up at a specific space on a building. And there were researchers kind of hiding, watching. And they would take count as other people would kind of stop and be like, what are you looking at? Like, what's, what's, what are they looking at? And they may stop for just a few moments and move on. But they couldn't help but just stop and look as well. And, and they found it was exponential as more people joined them. Not just one person, but maybe they'd have like two plants or three or maybe up to like five. Five people who were scheduled to all kind of stop and just together stand there and look up. And they found that the crowd would get bigger and bigger as more people would stop. Maybe even just for a moment, but on a busy New York City street, they would stop to look. May it be so with us that we who have dedicated and devoted our lives to being followers of Jesus, may it be so apparent by your work, by your words, by your life, that we as a community of faith, that when others in this church, when people in the community of Stillwater, when our children around the world, when others look at us, they can't help but by seeing the way we live, have to stop and say, what is it you're looking at? I want to get a glimpse of what you're following and focusing on.
So let it be so. May it start by not making things overly complicated. You don't have to, don't just sit and worry about like, well, how many times have I been in worship this month? Did I give a full tithe? Did I read the Bible and did I pray enough today? Just let's simplify it. Just start with answering the question, am I following? Are my eyes upon, am I focusing, am I following Jesus? With my words, my actions, my life. Because our children and everyone, they're watching. And so may they see who it is we follow by how we answer that question. Are we following? Amen. I invite you to join with me as we go to God in an attitude of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are humbled that, that you would have use of us, that you would call out our names and invite us to follow you. Help us to say yes to that call, to rise up and to follow, but to not become distracted by things around us or things that cross our paths, but that we may keep our focus on you. Open our eyes that we might see you. Lead us and guide us and use us, we pray. Come alive in us. Amen. Please rise and bow your spirit and join us.
And yes, more cowbell is an acceptable comment <laughs> on the surveys. Yes. We hope and, that, and, and pray that for each and every one of us, whether you're here in this space or you're joining with us remotely, we hope and pray that we are alive with Christ. We, that's all that we need. That is him that we seek to focus upon and follow after. And maybe as you're asking yourself that question of, am I following? Am I following in my life? And maybe one thing that will help you to answer that question, maybe one way that you can follow Christ more closely is by ensuring you have a family of faith, a community that you can encourage and strengthen and follow alongside with. If that's the case, then we'd love to have you join us here at the Stillwater First United Methodist Church. I invite you to talk to myself, Pastor Kyle, or Pastor Cindy as you leave today. Or you can give us a call, send us an email, leave a comment there on our YouTube page. We'd love to set a time to get to know one another and get to know what it means to be a member of the Stillwater First United Methodist Church. And with that, I invite you just to sing together as we make that commitment to live for Christ. this week. Go out into the world and live Christ. For coming and joining us for worship online today. If you haven't done so yet, I invite you to take some time to put your name and, and where you're worshiping from in the comments section. Check out our website at fumcstw.org where you can learn more about our missions and ministries and how you can support God's kingdom work through Stillwater First UMC. And I really do hope that you'll take the time to fill out that worship survey. Survey Once again, uh, you can find that QR code right here. Scan that and you can fill out that survey. We'd love to know what your worship experience is like as someone who worships with us online. Once again, also, if there's any way I can be of assistance to you, uh, be of service to you, be your pastor, don't hesitate to reach out to me at kanderson at fumcstw.org. I'd love to be in contact with you. And until next week, feel free and I hope that you find ways to both experience and then pass on the truth of God's goodness. See you soon.